And also, sorry, you just walked in on a brain um, no, no, release. No, no, um, I'm going to take that bowl with me. I think I just said I think you should read me the list again. You want to read the list? Okay. Yeah. You really want to hear the list again? I want to hear the list. Okay. I want you to wrap the list. Okay. Kit list. Waterproof jacket. Full leg cover tape. Waterproof trousers. Insulated layer. Down jacket, warm layer, warm hat, or two buffs, gloves, minimum one litre water, 800 calories, a minimum. Fuck. Hang on, start again. Waterproof jacket, full leg cover, tape, waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like the primary school teacher is way better than the first time. Okay. <laughs> waterproof jacket, full leg cover, tape, waterproof okay. trousers. Okay. Water, food, a cup that can stand, bowl, food, me. <laughs> If you stand there, yeah, here, yeah, and don't be in the shop like that. And then it's like I'm being interviewed, but I'm talking to you. Okay. So you've got to ask me about the race. How's the race, Mia? Yeah. <laughs> it's not started yet. Uh, how are you feeling about the race, Mia? Yeah. I don't like to call it a race. <laughs> you don't answer. How's the not race? <laughs> the nut race. <laughs> the nut race. I'm not partaking in a nut race. What are you partaking in? I'm taking part in an event. Oh, okay. How's the event? It's not started yet! <laughs> um, it's a poor interview. How far is the event? Uh, 110 kilometres, which equates to about 68.2 miles. Where is the event? It starts. <laughs> Right, ask very questions. What's the most challenging thing about ultra running? Um <laughs> It's probably when um when you're in a really dark place. <laughs> what physically dark? Yeah. <laughs> So when you're going to be on the big hill, then it's going to be done. Yeah. What have you learnt since you ran your first ultra that you're going to, you know, take into this one? <laughs> I think what I've learnt is to, is to stop thinking that I can do it. <laughs> Ask me why I do it. Uh, why do you do it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> why do you do it? Why do you, why do you run? No, why do I do events? Okay, uh, what am I... <laughs> I? I do a serious answer now. Okay, why why do you do these runs? By the way, didn't you repeat your question because I can just like Yeah, I know, but you were like, ask me, ask me louder. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think um I think what I've actually really learned is that Yeah, <laughs> I that's so profound, you know. Um I think you should share that message with the world, to be honest, because it's so inspirational and um, how, how people can't hear that, you know, everything you've learned and just really apply it to anything in their life, anything they're struggling with, when they're in a dark place, you know, they can hear your advice, everything you've learned and just take that with them, you know. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, it's just nice to receive, I guess like full feedback yeah about how... and support and yeah. not so I can stick on this at all yeah I know because um you know these these events aren't 
They're not, it's not just about the running. No. It's, uh, it, it's so much more than running. Yeah. It's walking. <laughs> So four days ago, I ran a 67.2 mile ultramarathon, which is about 109.45 kilometers in the Lake District with 12,000 feet of elevation um, in torrential rain, gale force winds, weird terrain and a lot of pain. Um, and you know what? It was great. I had a great time. Um, and I learned a lot, quite a lot. Um, and actually it evoked a strong um, insight into myself which I don't think had been so apparent before. Running has always been something that like I've done like on my own, you know, it's always been like a, I don't know, I guess time for me and really I've had nobody that I know that also runs in the mountains or whatever. Um, and equally there's kind of, you know, mainly just this kind of discomfort of running with anybody else and, you know, running is this kind of space and time where there's nothing that I need to do, there's nothing that I need to try and prove, there's nothing, there's no pretense that needs to occur, I can just relax and just be. And yeah, I guess running with somebody kind of creates a sense of, um, yeah, it, it, it's not as freeing. Um, but really actually what, what is revealing itself to me constantly is how important people are and how much in life, you know, aside from just running, connections with people are the best thing that we have as humans and yeah going into this run I wanted to make friends and by that I meant I wanted to connect with people and speak with people because I often I find it far too easy to um, run away from the discomfort of engaging with people and although I'm really sociable and I love company and I love you know socialness um, I have a you know a familiar pattern and a inbuilt fear from being younger that people leave and that people leave and they don't come back and then maybe they come back but they leave again and people can hurt you you know and if people can hurt you so can everything else that changes in life so can everything else that actually isn't within your controllable grasp so why bother you know it's much safer to be on your own it's much safer to learn how to be okay on your own and to learn how to cope on your own because then nobody can take that away from you and I think I've kind of grown up with a sort of strong sense of needing to protect myself and needing to shield myself from the world and people um, from being hurt, you know, and being frightened that any vulnerability, any, um, you know, just letting myself relax with people or let myself appreciate and enjoy relationships I have with people results in instant fear because they're going to leave anyway and then it's going to hurt. So. Yeah, so much more sense in my mind to just avoid it and to, you know, it's a commended thing in society is to be the lone wolf and to be the kind of, you know, like, I'm an achiever and I do things and I do hard things on my own and I don't need people's company, I don't need people's help. But people are freaking awesome, you know, and we're all here on this earth to hold each other's hand and help each other. I like truly believe that and it's taken and takes a lot of sitting with that discomfort and finding a place within that actually is home. That people aren't scary anymore, relationships aren't scary anymore. Um, <laughs> there was kind of this sense which I never quite recognised of like, you know, I, I, I learned from an age that I need to learn to be okay on my own because I was on my own all the time and I need to learn to be okay without these vital relationships which I thought I needed. And I learned how to do that, you know, and you, you, I sought that out in achievement, I sought that out in doing things, I sought that out in proving myself to myself to try and gain approval from others, from myself, you know, constantly yearning and seeking for love that you never quite got enough of and that deep down you probably don't think you're worthy of and it's just a slippery slope and yeah, there's, I guess there's this kind of subtle sense that I notice with ultra running of like, you know, running with people is great and it, in the last couple of runs I've done the last couple of ultras, I've ran with people and it's kind of like being kind of easy, like I've not got to the end like, oh wow, you know, I don't actually think I could have kept going. It's like, that was like such fun, that was awesome, I want to do it again. And there's almost a sense of like, well that's kind of cheating, you know, if in life I'm relying upon these people in this event to help me have a good time, then well they're going to leave anyway and that's cheating. 
I, can, I was kind of pursuing and searching for this experience where I could really prove to myself, you know what, I can do this completely on my own. I don't need anybody else. I'm not reliant upon anybody else. And in, in Scotland, when I attempted a 100 mile ultramarathon, it didn't go very well. I dropped out at 70 miles because I didn't make it in time and I just lost all hope and yeah, I was dying on the inside and outside. Um, there's really no need to, to suffer. And living in a place of fear where people are going to hurt you and where people where, an in, where intimate relationships can't exist because there is the fear of them ending or the fear of you being hurt. It's a really narrow confinement of life and it's done through survival, you know, it's done through a defensive mechanism to try and keep you safe and to to shield you from further pain and trauma. But there's, there comes a point where that must, that must be let go of before you burn yourself into the ground from trying to do it all on your own. <clears throat> trying to do it all on your own. And yeah, this kind of, this kind of need to like do something so extreme and kind of push myself to the extreme edges, you know, that finding the edges. It, it's There's like a really subtle driving force which is to try and give myself the comfort of knowing that completely on my own, in the hardest of conditions, in the roughest of places, I can get myself through. And there's this kind of angst that comes with that of needing to prove that even more because I've had to do that for a very long time, you know, on my own, needing to get myself through. And living in survival isn't a way of operating that's sustainable. Especially when you recognise that you're, you're still choosing to live there. You know, we, we operate there without choice, we operate there without recognition that we're doing that. When the recognition comes, then it's time to be courageous and to dance. And to say, okay, this is scary and terrifying, this is not my normal mode of operating, but I'm going to do it. And for me, this ultramarathon, 70 miles in the lakes, was a real kind of a real kind of example of that, of, you know, the whole time I was basically with somebody and the last 40 miles I was with the same four people, we had a little team and, well, four me included, and it was just so much easier, you know, and, you know, solitude is important, being okay alone is definitely important and I'm not saying that we should put our reliance upon other people or things outside of us because that's another shaky place to exist, but any extreme is bad, you know, a complete dependence or complete withdrawal is never going to lead to a state of it being good. It's going to lead to a state of extremes, which is never a good place to be. You know, this this whole run, like, I experienced such discomfort momentarily of like, oh, I'm with, I'm like, I'm with people, and like, you know, like this isn't quite what I'm here for, and 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 also I have to try and you know perhaps put put a paper tense, or I, I, what if I let them down, or what if they let me down, or what if they leave me behind, or all these social fears that come up that it's easier just to be alone because it's safer because I'm in the confines of my own thoughts even though it's not very nice sometimes and even though actually it's way harder because there's nobody there to pull you out when you need pulling out it's almost like a an angsty acceptance of wait well yeah we're just on our own forever and we gotta cope with it but we're not we're really not and yeah, this was just a beautiful discovery to me because I've run with people before in ultras, but this was more like a, I recognize that I don't want to because I'm scared and because of this whole proving a point to myself or trying to make myself feel safe. And it was a recognition of how I live a lot in the rest of my life and how some, you know, many relationships, I do struggle to receive love. I do struggle to sometimes to to be with people because it feels scary because if I enjoy it then uh oh they're gonna leave you know the confinements of the space between my two ears seems way safer even though way more uncomfortable way more depressing sometimes um, so yeah this is a story about people and about the importance of people and about the importance of sharing about the importance of of being both the guiding light and being guided by others' light. About 13 miles in, uh, I feel really good. Body feels awesome. Um, I'm just
just didn't feel tired. We did half of it on the last two ultras, um, and mainly it's just so beautiful, um, so beautiful. And um, he's been climbing for like two hours, um, so that's a fun bit. about, I don't know, 24, 25 miles in, um, the rain has been hammering us and going through a very, very steep, rocky, loose descent. Um, my feet, um, holy shit, just want to tell, I did just fall. Um, yeah, feet are starting to get a little bit sore, I think. Um, I think it's just because I'm coming down here, I don't think they're listed. Um, but the tape's not working, um, it just doesn't stuck in, so I'm literally having to Vaseline them up and hope for the best. So freaking sticky. significant occurred until probably mile 35 um you know to set the scene it was windy stormy rainy wet the ground was like a constant bog with jagged rocks slippy grass i slipped over so many times um and you know i was just having a great time and it wasn't a time of like you know it wasn't like a, wow this is amazing oh my god i'm so excited i'm gonna die it was like just nothing there was just nothingness it was like there was no thought there was no dialogue there was no commentary there was no judgment there was there was nothing it wasn't good or bad it just was but it was just this rhythm and this flow and I kept there was always somebody with me I was keeping somebody's feet at all times and chatting to people and it was just wonderful and you know the moments where you don't want to run you don't think you can run you think you need to walk but the person in front of you is running and you're like you know what I'm just going to keep to their feet and you do and it's all fine anyway at mile 35 um, we began to go up another climb, um, maybe the third or fourth climb of the, of the day. And I just felt this like lull, you know, it was almost like the edge of this descending into something. So it's, it's 4 p.m. So I'm 10 hours in. I think I'm about 38 miles. Who knows? Um, just hitting my first low patch which is pretty incredible and um, like I've literally felt amazing up until this point um, it's just a low, it'll be fine I just don't think I've eaten enough in the last couple of hours so I'm just trying to eat um, but they've changed the route because the weather is like weather warnings so um, I'm currently following somebody and hoping they're runners because I have no idea where I'm going but yeah just sharing that I'm in a low. <laughs> yeah.
and then got to the top of the climb at like mile 40 and then managed to catch up with the two people ahead that I was kind of chasing and these two people, Bev and Kieran, I ended up kind of staying with for the rest of the race. So I was feeling shit for the last like two hours and then this happened. So beautiful, look at that. And now we've got downhill, which I'm happy about. Either way, my legs are beginning to be a little bit tired. Um, but I mean, I think it's gonna be very slippy. Look at that, awesome. And then kept going, you know, kept going. It was wet, very wet, very, very wet. The kind of wet where like, if somebody was to tip your body upside down, water would like come out of your ears and like your nose, like my bones were wet. And yeah, we got to this 44 mile checkpoint, kept going and I have never had an appetite so big. Like I literally, I think I ate two giant grab bags of Walker's crisps, um, a third of a pizza and just sweets. And normally by that point in a race, like I don't want to eat anything, I'm not hungry. Um, yeah, but it was, it was fine. So 45 miles in, um, definitely feeling it now. Um, we've got about an hour left of daylight. Just been really cold the last like, half hour. Um, but I'm warming up now, I'm running. Um, and I've just stuffed my face at the checkpoint, which is good. I'm unbelievably hungry, which is amazing. So, quite another six miles, I think, to the next checkpoint. Pretty flat, and then it'll be dark. And then, yeah, we can end up in the mountains again. It'll be dark, and the storm is on its way. So, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. But yeah, literally, it got soaking wet. Like, it's been raining since about one o'clock. It's now six o'clock, so. And we just kept moving. Like, it was just, you know, you're tired, but but I think something that I definitely, like, recognised in this, in this event was, like, when I, if, I'm, if and when I was on my own, or when I would be on my own in a different event, by this stage, like, I'm gonna walk. Like, you know, unless it's downhill, or unless it's, like, definitely 100% flat. I'm walking or at least I'm gonna run and then walk a bit because like you're knackered like you've been running for you know 10 11 hours 40 45 miles the weather's shit um you know you, you, you're tired and when you're with people what it made me realize was like oh wait like I can actually run here and at a good pace too and you fall into a rhythm where I just kept having small moments of like I can't believe I'm running this fast and I've already ran 45 miles because previously it would be like, oh, I've ran 45 miles, therefore I can't run fast. But this was a real kind of thing of, no, I, like, I actually can, you know? And it was really cool. And then kept going, got to this checkpoint at mile 50. It had like a log burner. Um, there were two corgis. It was awesome. I ate a pot of pasta. Life was good. We were about to go into the, well, it was already night. We were about to go up on yeah. to the mountain, about 700 meters up. And basically there was now a storm and it was progressively worse. <laughs> This is amazing. I know, I know. This is fantastic. This might be like the best pasta I've ever had. Try it and roll it. I mean, the people in Italy are scared of the If you got like served it in a restaurant, you'd probably uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you But right now, it's, right now it's phenomenal. <laughs> it's a lot warmer here than what it was last week. Oh yeah, it was freezing. I mean, you do this past it, so like, this is a good checkpoint. You, you have a fire. That's, that's <laughs> Anyway, we left this checkpoint um, and we started to climb up and I noticed that I was way slower than they were on the climbing um, which I was like, okay, I'm just gonna have to kind of work really hard because I am not being on my own in this section because it was like 50 mile per hour uh, wind gusts, rain, darkness, mountains, scary. <laughs> um, so I was like, I want to be with people. There was nobody really behind us, nobody in front of us at all. 
Um, so anyway, we start climbing, our eyes are super slow. Then like my whole body, like my head, my legs, my hands, felt like they were made of air and I became so weak. And basically I thought I was gonna faint. I've never fainted in my entire life. Never really been on the verge of fainting either. Um, just haven't had that experience. And was like, holy shit, what the fuck is this feeling? This does not feel good. Recognized, okay, maybe I just need some more food, but I was a bit confused because I'd just eaten some pasta and whatever. But basically, two hours prior to that, I'd had two hours of not eating anything accidentally. And because I ate so much checkpoints, it did mean that I was kind of not being so stringent on every hour making sure I eat. And I wasn't eating that much at checkpoints, I just wasn't eating cereal bars. Anyway, so I was like, I need to, I had big thick gloves on and I was like, I just need to take them off, get my food out of my bag. But I just didn't even have the strength to take my, the, my gloves off my, off my hands. Kept going, kept going, and I could just feel this like sickness and this shakiness and this weakness. And I was recognised like I am running low on something. Um, anyway, I ended up like diverging off the path, and thankfully, one of the people in our little team called me back because I was like going the complete wrong way. Managed to eventually stop, had some brownie, and then could feel myself like being rebuilt again, and I was fine. But then I was like, okay, I need to not ever have that gap between eating, because like we were going up this like you know path up the top and like pretty steep edge in the dark, in the wind, like. Especially if I was on my own there and I collapsed, like, it wouldn't have been good. So, anyway, we got to the top of the climb and there were some marshals there and they were like, and I was so relieved to be there because I was like, finally we're at the top, it's the last big climb, like, you know, anyway. They said, guy basically said, by the way, um, you know, I've just come up here from the other way, the way that you're going to go down. Just a warning, um, the wind blew up, blew me up my feet, the wind is really, really strong, but don't worry, don't panic it doesn't last for long, but just be prepared that it's really, really strong. So you kind of like, Slippy grass, like this, with like mud that's kind of gone like this. Um, anyway, we started moving. The second we went downhill, this knee just died. Um, I've never had any problem with my knee, ever. Long story short, it was painful, the wind was awful, um, but I just kept Bev's feet in front of me and just stayed at them. Slipped about five times. This knee got progressively worse, but I was like, it'll be fine. You know, like it'll get over itself, it will heal. Anyway, we finally got to the bottom like an hour later and it was now about 55 miles in. I mean, it's still really scary. My hair is going really climbing up. Because <sighs> my, for like 10 minutes I was really dizzy. And my hands, my hands were going like that. Really? And I, and I couldn't get stuff out of my bag. And then, it was really scary. How is your knee? How are you going to cut your knee? I, I think it'd be okay, because mainly for that. Just that was literally like, so steep and slippy for, Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm happy I'm to see you there. Um, I could do with some gel with the paint because I can't. Right, right, you just go around there. You've got enough cabbage stuff. You've got any more pizza? I've got pizza. Yeah, but I've really got some. Kind of relaxed then, because it was like I've got another 13 miles, there's no huge climbs left. We were way off, way, way, way off the cut of times, like, you know, we had loads of time. Um, and it was like, if I need to walk, I can walk because my, my knee was bad and my knee was getting worse. I don't worry, I'll get it down. You can move it. I mean, you get an abundance in everyone. Yeah. Yeah. You're awesome. I think given it's their first event as well. Anyway, the last like 30 miles, I didn't film anything, but basically, it was basically a story of my knee getting much, much worse, being it happened to go slower and slower and slower, but we stayed together as a group. We've played I Spy. So it's 2 a.m. About two miles from the finish. Um, the last 18 miles, I've been unable to run. Oh man, that's kicked my balls. Um, or barely walk, really. Um, my left knee is just completely gone. Um, it's so painful. <laughs> And also my bum cheeks are chafing and it's awful. But we're nearly there. I just can't run, which sucks. Um, yeah. Oh, what is it? Yeah. Woo! Come on, Mia! Abbott! <laughs> And then basically like, there's not really anything else to say, it was just great and there is such an importance placed on 
like, you know, at least in my brain on like finding these edges and you know, like I, I kind of, I wanted to experience that place where like I don't think I can. And I had that in Scotland, you know, four months ago, that 100 mile attempt, I had that. And <laughs> it's not actually that fun, you know? And this sense of like being with other people is kind of cheating because they help. The baseline doesn't need to be rough. And I think ultra running is so beautiful because it's like, it's an alignment of all these variables that are seemingly out of your control and you need to let go of them. You know, the weather, even your mood, your thoughts, your feelings, um, the terrain, the people around you, um, the food they have at checkpoints, how your stomach responds, like so much of that is completely beyond your control. Of course there's little things you could do to try and make it easier, try and make it more smooth, but ultimately it's kind of all out of your control. But equally there's the paradox of surrendering all of your control, but also at every moment and every opportunity regaining all of your autonomy and making sure that you act when you need to act. and that you don't cling on to an outcome from the action. And it's just the most beautiful thing because I think it really teaches you to like, to sow your seeds always and to take the action that you always wanna take and that you always feel like you need to take, but to not rely heavily on the outcome going as you want. You know, this 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 ultra was, was perfect. You know, apart from the last 20 miles, I couldn't run, I could barely walk. <laughs> Which, you know, saying that doesn't sound perfect, but I was having a good time. It's an alignment of variables and it's an alignment of how you are within. And for me, even though the conditions weren't great, like I had wet feet the whole time, it was raining, it was windy, my knee, um, X, Y, and Z, I still had a really good time because I didn't feel like I was trying to change. I didn't feel like I was trying to change what was happening. I didn't feel like I was trying to have a better time or judging the time I was having. I wasn't, you know, when my knee went and I was like, okay, I can't run, I wasn't forcing it. I wasn't stressing about it. It wasn't, I was just so relaxed. And like running's great because you know, if you've never run, run an ultra before, like, it can be perceived that it's this super hard thing. And like, you know, it, it's not easy. Of course it's not easy, like, obviously. But it's not like, like when you lift weights and you do a set of 10, like that's like 10 out of 10 intense pain. You couldn't bear that for 25 hours. When you run a 5K, you run at a speed that you couldn't sustain for an hour or two hours. Again, you wouldn't sustain that for 25 hours. When you run an ultra, how you do it, at least how I'm discovering to do it is, to slow down on every level and obviously there's the obvious physiological slowing down which means that you can sustain yourself and that you're not you know overusing on glucose and you're not causing too much muscle damage and x y z but also there's a slowing down on a, on, a, on a more within sense in that it's a slowing down of not trying to be in control of what's occurring and a slowing down of that rush that incessant rush that we have in life to be somewhere else faster to get somewhere sooner to achieve something quicker that rushing that kind of sits deep within us from society and from the things we do in life, in ultra running it kind of just, it forces you to slow down because you can't rush. Any sense of rushing creates badness. If, if you're rushing to get to the finish line, the whole experience is really hard because you're not present, you're not where your feet are, you're not like here now. The way to do it is to slow down and by slowing down you can truly appreciate and enjoy like your surroundings and the actual experience of right now, the people you're with, I, I definitely have like completed the chapter in the course in my life of learning to be on my own and you know it, it's a course and a chapter that I didn't realise had an end point it was just what I thought life was I thought like yeah it's painful but you know it's a good lesson I guess that people leave and you know that love isn't always what you think it is and you know your ideas of who should be you know unconditional with you aren't I guess it's a good lesson, you know, because you learn to stop relying on things and people and, and the world and the outside existence of things, but there is joy to be had with people and things and there is joy to be had, you know, what the orchestra of bringing them two things together can do. And I think for me, I'm, you know, I feel grateful that I have, I guess in this stage of my life, like, learnt to be on my own, learnt to be okay with my thoughts, learnt to live alone, learnt to do all these things alone because it means that I don't feel scared on my own, I don't feel incapable on my own. You know, I do feel a strong sense of, I can do it, I can cope, and you know, that that feels really important. 
but equally I'm aware as to how that can be a dark slippery slope where you take that on and you carry that as a shield with you for the rest of your life where the earth is bad, people are bad, life hurts, um, I'm not going to let anybody in, I'm not going to let anything in and I need to not cling on to anything, I need to not enjoy anything too much because it all just ends. And while there is truth in them words, the, the chapter has ended for me and you know I recognise in such amazing friendships I have and people around me that there is nothing to fear, you know, there is nothing to protect myself against or try and hide something of myself from or try and prove something of myself to and that really as people we're all just a bit fucked up, you know, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I don't mean that there's anything wrong with it, I just mean that we all have parts of ourselves that create fear, we all have parts of our history, of our past, of our experiences that we project into the now and into the future that makes that makes us feel scared, that make us feel like we need to control something, like we need to create a routine, like we need to manage the world and our and that's valid, you know, because we've experienced it and it's it's a physical thing that exists within our body and our mind. But to me there is no more important thing than to recognise the things that are driving you to do things. There's no more important thing than to recognise what is it that's, that makes you how you are, you know? Because there's a little voice in your head, a little voice of judgement, a little voice of fear, a little feeling that you cling on to, that you put into every situation that completely taints and distorts your view of what's actually happening. And for me, what it's presented itself as is fear with everything, you know, and mainly fear of people, fear of relationships, fear of friendships, fear of time with anybody, fear of not making every second of my day learning about how to be okay on my own, you know. Fear is no small thing. And there is, of course, you know, existing in the face of fear and, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. But when you can't recognise the fear that's there, you can't, you can't do it anyway. You think you are that fear that's occurring. But really you're not. Really we're not. And to me ultra running is important because it's a culmination of self-awareness and introspection and observation of, of, of me, of, you know, inside. And how I put that into the world. And it's the bringing together of body and mind and it's the bringing together of an art which is being present. Running ultramarathons is hard if you're not present, if you're not where your feet are, if you're not here. So is life, you know. The whole of life is hard if we're not attentive to now, if we're not present right now. And ultra running for me has brought to the surface things and moments and opportunities to grow where I would originally run away. And this time just happened to be people. This time just happened to be recognising the importance of people and recognising my resistance to people. A bit weird that, isn't it? Because I just ran 70 miles and I've made it into a philosophical, self-transformative experience. But honestly, I don't think you can't, like, I don't know, maybe I just think too much, but, like, running for 20 hours is a long time. <laughs> you know, like, there are micro traumas that occur within each hour of that that you need to process, and there are things that occur that that make you, you know, put things into a different perspective. And things are so raw when you run ultra marathons because there's nothing more important than looking after your basic needs and looking after yourself. And in life, sometimes I can get forgotten about because the importance of doing and achieving and these weird things that make important gets in the way, and I think it just really brings you back to your senses, and therefore brings you back to what's really important. So, that was my experience of running 70 miles. Um, I'm now having a year off in terms of, you know, not running. Um, I'll be running, but I'm not doing another event for another year. Um, my body needs to rest. I'm not a fan of the idea of doing more than three ultra marathons in a year. Um, so it's time, to, it's time to rest. I have some biomechanical issues with my, with my leg, um, which is why my my knee was bad, so I need to sort that out. And yeah, it's time for recovery. You know, ultras take a lot out of you, physically and mentally, and I think more so than you can recognise, there's a lot of internal damage that is done. You know, it would take probably a month to recover from this, um, physically. And I want to respect that. I don't want to, you know, disrespect that. 
because I did kind of disrespect my knee by running on it for another 20 miles when it was pink. So anyway. So yeah, that's it. Maybe a bit of a weird video, maybe a bit different. But hey, I'm wearing a stripy t-shirt, I am weird. Anyway, I also wrote an article on this in a bit more depth with a bit less uh, of a tiredness in my voice. If you'd like to read it, it'll be in the link below. Um, as a disclaimer, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, no idea. So I don't think I really filmed much of my run, but I got home at 5 a.m. this morning. Sunday, it's now 7 a.m. and obviously I woke up at 7 a.m. because that's what happens. And honestly, I feel like I've been hit by a bus. I actually can't walk. <laughs> My feet are throbbing so much. Oh! I can't stop shivering. <laughs> and I've also not had dinner. But it's confusing because it's 8 a.m. I've not had dinner. I don't really know what to do for myself because I need to eat some, I'm real, I need to have a shower. I need to have a shower. This is a face of a woman who, I don't know, something. I realised yeah. I don't try very hard. Yeah. Like actually. It, with anything? No. Well, yes, but like in, in ultra running, like I don't try hard. Explain. Like, you just create.